Welcome to Untangling Traditions. Today we'll be speaking with Professor Dagmar Vujasic, the Principal Investigator of the Ayayog Project. Welcome Dagmar. You've been working on the textual record of pre-modern Indian alchemy that begins in the 10th century and one aspect of your research has been the experimentation of reconstructing the alchemical labs and procedures of the past. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so that has been a very exciting aspect of our research where we're trying to um, develop a different kind of, of philology where we can understand procedures better through experimentation. Um, basically, Rasa Shastra or Indian alchemy is a living practice, though only the medical aspects have survived of this tradition. So today in India, you can become an Ayurvedic doctor through studying at a university or college, and then you can specialize in Rasa Shastra in yatra chemistry or chemical medicine. And um, this kind of medicine uses procedures described in pre-modern alchemical texts written in Sanskrit. Um, so, some practices, however, have uh, fallen out of use, and particularly those described in the very earliest of the alchemical works. So I've been translating a work from probably the 10th century, the Rasa Hridaya Tantra, the Heart of Mercury. And uh, in uh, its second chapter, it describes something called sanskaras, which are alchemical procedures for making an, uh, a mercurial elixir that then is applied to making gold or per for perfecting the body. So when I was translating this chapter, I was really struck at how concise the description was. Uh, we're talking about 13 verses uh, for eight of 18 procedures. And I was just thinking of how much this text would actually lend itself for use. So could an alchemist have this text in front of them and then do the procedures as described. So um, luckily I um, am in touch with uh, someone who studied Rasa Shastra Yatra chemistry in Sri Lanka. This is Andrew Mason, who lives in the UK. And he was willing to conduct uh, an experiment with me uh, on trying to reconstruct the uh, first eight procedures, uh, these sanskaras, as described in this 10th century alchemical work, the Rasa Hridaya Tantra. And uh, it's been a very interesting process. Andrew has been doing these procedures and filming them, documenting them since October. So for more than half a year, we've been at it. So think of this, there are 13 verses. And uh, at the moment, we're in the seventh month, uh, I think, of, of reconstructing these procedures. So you are currently reconstructing the alchemical procedures of a 10th century Sanskrit text with Dagma, and this text is known as the Heart of Mercury. So can you tell us more about your work? Yeah, it was, uh, it was something we discussed. It, it just came off the cuff when we were talking about something else and uh, Dagma said that she'd uh, been interested in trying, obviously she's reading about this stuff all the time and translating it, but she just wondered if it could be uh, transposed into something more solid. So she said, do you think you could actually have a go at it? And I'd never actually tried um, those specific methods in there. I've, I've done similar methods. Like I said, there are many roads to Rome in, in Rasa Shastra. You can prepare things uh, a multitude of ways. So um, this, was a, this was a chance to sort of try and do it in a, uh, it was a much more long-winded way of doing it, uh, but, but interesting to me. So I was kind of in, you know, I said, yes, I'd be interested in doing that. So, so how did you begin the process of reconstruction? It was, uh, it was trying to really get a really systematic approach to it, I think. Looking at everything, I had to read the text quite a few times to really understand or try and understand what they were saying because it's not, it's not a very specific. It, it tends to leave, uh, there's a lot left out. They're assuming already that you know how to do a lot of this stuff. So it was just really reading the text over and over again and trying to come to some sort of understanding about what I was doing and in what order. And then the next thing was obviously to source all the materials. So it doesn't use anything too strange in it. Obviously, mercury is the main ingredient, but you know, I, I just happen to have some of that. <laughs> um, but some of the herbal materials 
were a little bit problematic because of the interest in Ayurveda in the UK. You know, there are a lot of people that do stock uh, Ayurvedic herbs, so that wasn't too much of a problem, but there were one or two that were more difficult. So I was able to source those eventually. Unfortunately, I, I'm using ground herbs. Probably they were using the, the herb more in their dried root form or bark form or something like that. So I've, I've had to work with the, with the powder. So you, you have to sort of keep in mind when you're watching all of these videos, when, they're, when, you, you know, when you're seeing all the work that we've done, that we've tried to use well, basically what, what we could get hold of. So we've, we've had to compromise on a few things. So the other problem was obviously the equipment. Um, it, it, was, it was nice that we, we'd agreed to try and keep the equipment to as, as authentic as possible. So that meant basically if we were using pots, they should really look like, you know, 10th century pots. <laughs> so uh, a good friend of mine locally who's a, uh, um, he's an experimental archaeologist. He describes himself as an experimental archaeologist. But he's also a very good potter, excellent potter. So uh, I kind of went to him and said, look, this is what we need. This is what it involves. Can it be done? And he said, yes, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. So again, even when we were making the pots, we tried to keep them as authentic as possible. So trying to keep stuff that was um, a little bit uh, kind of rustic looking, you know, nothing too finished or polished, but at the same time that it could withstand the temperatures and the kind of uh extremes that we were going to expose these things to so that was a big part of the project as well i think just even doing the pottery took us something like two and a half three months mm -hmm. by the time we'd mixed the clay you know beaten it into shape and then thrown it on a wheel molded it and then it, of course it took a long time to dry because it's the winter here and the uk is terribly wet and damp <laughs> and then uh, actually firing it. And then there was some finishing at the end, you know, there was some sealing. I had to seal all the pots with um, different, you know, sort of uh, homemade paints to try and seal the porosity of the pots. Obviously they're quite porous when you're cooking stuff in them. Um, so yeah, it was a challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm quite pleased with the outcome. There are some things I would have done, diff I would do differently if we did the thing, did the project again, but I'm quite happy with what we, what we've produced. So one example would be, for instance, when we were doing the uh, the design for the uh, the sublimation pot. So we had a drawing uh, or somebody's interpretation of what they thought was the best way to do it, which actually involved just two pots sitting together. And there's a rim, uh, like a bridge between the two pots. And this would normally be like, you think of it like a moat, it would be full of water. And then the two pots would brace together. And then the idea is that the water would form the seal to stop any vapors escaping. And even if vapor is forced out by an inner pressure, uh, the, the coldness or the, the you know, passing through the water would in theory um, condense the mercury vapor back into the droplets again. So the idea is that the, the loss would be very low. But what we found was when we tried an initial one, just an exp like, an, uh, you know, like a trial run to see how it went, um, as the water heated and produced steam and it rose into the top uh, compartment it was cooling very quickly and it was creating a vacuum so it was actually started sucking the water in from the rim pulling it into the pot which of course dropped to the bottom of the pot created more steam which went up and condensed and cooled even quicker and then pulled even more water in so all that happened was we were just forever filling it up with water and it was just basically just filling the pot full of water so it, it, that design didn't work so um the uh, the guy I was working with, um, Bill the Potter, uh, like I say, he's a bit of an experimental archaeologist. He um, he already makes um, sauerkraut pots, uh, which use a very similar technique. You know, for um, uh, what do you call it when you're fermenting the uh, like fermented foods? So that has a water seal on it. But he came up with the idea. He said, well probably the water is a good way to act as a seal, but it needs something to stabilize it so the water just can't be drawn in. So something damp that's not flexible and not moving would be better. So we just came up with the idea of a cotton cloth. I cut sort of cotton cloth uh, washers, like a big circle with a, you know, a circular section, dropped it into the moat and just packed it up with three or four layers of that. And I was just wetting it as I was cooking. So as it went through the, the cooking process, I would just squirt some water in there and keep that cloth damp. And it worked really, really well. In fact, so well, when I was uh, corresponding with some of the, um, some people that have been helping me in India who were using the same techniques, um, they said that, you know, our, our loss rate was 
was amazing. I mean, we were we were losing much less than they were losing. So you know, it was as an inner, as a sort of an ad hoc innovation. It was it actually seemed to be really good. So we don't know if they were using that technique. It doesn't seem like it, or if they were, it's never mentioned. But you know, we just came came to that technique in our own uh, experimentation, and it worked very well. I mean, we we were experiencing very little loss. So you know, I think sometimes uh, some of the Indians were saying, you know, it wasn't uncommon to lose uh, like a quarter of the content to vapor. Um, you know, in the end, we lost something like an eighth, such a, a very small amount. So that innovation actually worked really well. Yeah, so the, the Sanskrit verses are quite um, concise. So how much of your personal experience have the, has informed the reconstruction process? It's difficult to say exactly, but quite a bit, obviously, because I prepared a lot of these things before, or I've worked with them or just kind of understand what they're saying. So, and there's certain safety, obviously, it's a, it's a dangerous uh, material so you've got to be there's an element of um, personal safety you have to do things that you know are going to protect you while you're making it yeah I was drawing a lot on what I'd already done and what I'd seen so you know a, a little bit of both really I think we were kind of feeling our way if I got really stuck and I wasn't clear about what the text was saying I'd go back to Dagmar and she would just look at it again and we'd have a discussion and then we'd move from that point but I think most of it was fairly okay. Just, just you know, the the usual stuff. It's they're they're assuming that you've already prepared this and you know what that procedure would be. So they're just kind of pieces of information are missing. Like you know, they'd say there's no quantity given, or it would just say a part and not say what part of the plant or something like that. So, what has been uh, one of the most challenging aspects or surprising aspects of the reconstruction process for you? being able to dedicate that amount of time to it. I mean, obviously we've all got, we're all busy people. We've all got busy lives. So, but uh, you have to dedicate a certain amount of time each day. It is a very uh, long process. That's another downside of it. I remember when I was, um, <clears throat> before I began, I spoke to somebody in India who was already preparing. And I said, how long did you take to do the whole, to do the eight procedures, which is uh, just a small part of the whole overall thing. And they were saying it took them one year. And I thought, yeah you know that's ridiculous i mean i should be able to do it in a month <laughs> or at least three months i was thinking in my mind well you know we're we're kind of we start in october so it's already uh you know it's already sort of june isn't it may june so it's taken me that long and i'm only halfway through it so probably a year was a realistic time frame so that's the that's been the hardest thing really is to i've got to get up go out and spend sort of an hour two hours a day just standing and mixing <laughs> You know, on some days it's good. You feel totally okay and the time goes quite quickly and you enjoy it. Other days when you're busy and you don't want to be standing in the cold stirring, <laughs> uh, the time goes very slowly. <laughs> so that's been quite challenging. Yeah, I, I think it, it, was a, it was a lot more time consuming than we'd, we'd envisaged. envisaged. And I, I suppose, you know, looking at in the 10th century, uh, you know, these Rasa masters standing on the slopes of the Himalayas, they probably had all day and every day and there was no rush. So... <laughs> They didn't, they weren't wearing a wristwatch. <laughs> yeah, so do you have a sense of how much of uh, pre-modern alchemy has been informed by a deep understanding of chemistry and science? That's very difficult to say um, because of the way that the way that it's worded or the language that they're using is kind of can be a little bit flowery sometimes or it can be a little bit metaphysical but yeah, I mean, I think they, they had a good understanding of elements. They understood what they were working with and how these things would change or perform under certain conditions. So, you know, I mean, when we think about alchemy, it's, it's like, it's chemi, isn't it? It's chemistry, it's early chemistry. So I think, it's, I don't know, I'm not enough of an, uh, an expert to say on the history of alchemy, you know, how much of this is actually... Um, how much of this is still validated but i think science would agree with most of their if you if you were to read most of these texts and to go and speak to a chemist i'm sure they'd agree with the conclusions maybe the methodology or the reasons why it was happening they wouldn't agree yeah and, and i noticed as well when i was working in sri lanka when you were working in the in the rasa department um they're very kind of aware of modern scientific methods you know they know all the chemical formulas they know all the kind of modern uh, chemical interpretations and they're very much using those or having an understanding of those but they're combining them as well with the traditional uh, how these materials were traditionally viewed so it's a little bit of both I think 
you know, there is something quite magical about it. I mean, you know, they speak about mercury when it's mixed with other metals, that it devours them, that it, what you're doing is you're opening its mouth and it's kind of getting hungry and wanting to digest. And, you know, if you, when you're mixing it, there is something, you can see how they arrived at that conclusion. So for instance, if you put copper in to the mercury, at first it's almost like it doesn't want to, doesn't want to take, it's like it's pushed away, but continually grinding it sort of, opens up a portal or something and it, it sort of seems to go in and the material seems to thicken so you lose you lose the surface copper seems to disappear a little bit the actual mercury appears to thicken so it's almost like somebody's eaten something and sort of expanded and got a bit heavy but then you come back the next morning and stir it and the mercury's gone very liquid again it's like it's lost that heaviness again it's almost like it's digested it <laughs> so you can see how they've arrived at these conclusions you know they're looking at it in a very sort of practical light and really trying to make sense about what's you know what's happening to the material in terms of in terms of you know how, how would it affect the human body and is that representative in the material that they're processing so that that's that's a, an interesting side as well yeah absolutely the the language is really a beautiful metaphor for what you're actually seeing or often it could pot potentially um, inform the practitioner of what to look for as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. so how do these procedures that you're that the the tenth century procedures? How do these compare to some of the methods and techniques that you were taught during your study of contemporary Ayurveda? Mostly just more protracted, more more involved. Um, so, obviously, if you're working in a modern environment and they're producing these medicines on a on a, like a conveyor belt system. So for instance, the, the, the factory where I was, one of the factories I was able to look around and actually working at the hospital, which had its own in-house factory. Um, it's like a conveyor belt system. So they're constantly making it. So they were preparing iron remedies there and they knew that it would take them about four years to complete the remedy. But as stuff's falling off the end of the conveyor belt, stuff's going onto the conveyor belt. So there's a constant, you know, they're pr producing it all the time. It's just an ongoing process. So um, it's the same with the mercurial preparations. You know, there are, there are many ways to do it, but over time, I guess they have trying to look at the methods that produce uh, the safest results, but the minimum amount of uh, time needs to be uh, spent on that to, to bring it up to that level. So when you look at these old texts, they're much more involved. I mean, for instance, most modern processing is three, uh, they'll use three kind of uh, tiers of processing. Some people only use one. There are, I've seen methods where they just use one 24 hour continuous processing, but generally it's like three separate processings of nine hours. So this uh, more ancient approach is um, much more involved. I mean, you've literally got eight, eight procedures and each procedure is a kind of a, a sort of a work in itself it's a you know very very involved so it's yeah it's, it's 10 10 times longer to, to, to do the same thing now that the proof of the pudding will be when we've finished it and we actually make a remedy from it and then try it is it 10 times better so i i can't say that yet because i have this is the first time i actually use this method myself so i don't know but um Having tried the uh, the three the standard three tier method, uh, I was seeing that used quite successfully in pharmacies, and they were getting their problems with it. So, you would think that if this is ten times longer, then it should be ten times better. But we'll see. Well, the, the the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. <laughs> so, so the outcome will be that you will attempt to use some of this purified uh, mercury in um, an elixir. This process really is just a, a sort of a cleaning process, if you like. It's just preparing it to be, you know, we could, we could go on and do all 18 procedures. I mean, that's something we've talked about. Of course, uh, the first eight are kind of reasonable. They're doable, if you know what I mean. They're, if you look at them, they're, 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 well, we are, we're doing them, so they can be done. The, the remaining uh, 10 steps start to get a bit um, uh, super involved and start asking for some pretty bizarre materials to complete uh, one of them was uh, like earwax from buffaloes <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it all gets a bit um it all gets a bit more involved we'll see Let, let's just we'll, we'll get the eight processes done and get this wrapped up and then we'll make a decision about what we want to do with it or how far we want to to take it well the videos that i have seen of the reconstruction so far have been absolutely beautiful particularly the 
um, making of the first uh, bowl in which you steam the mercury and it seems to come out brilliantly um, iridescent in its colour. So I look forward to watching you move through the eight procedures and where it goes from there. So thank you very much, Andrew, for your time. No problem.